Uh, okay, so we want to welcome you to this month's session of Holmes at Home, which is, of course, honoring uh, Dr. Holmes, who did many uh, speeches and different conversations uh, out in the community. And so we're doing similar things, and we've been bringing outsiders in in the fall, and then in the spring, we've been really showcasing our staff and the people that we have here. Sorry, uh, am I still here? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so we are, we've been showcasing off our staff. Last month, Tom talked about kind of the context that Handles was writing in, uh, what was going on kind of out in the world to give us an idea of what we're gonna be talking about this week, which Garrett is gonna be talking about the Messiah and maybe showing us a little bit of our very own folks um, playing and singing and it'll be a real treat. So thank you so much, Garrett, for having us tonight or for, for hosting us tonight. And uh, we're excited to hear from you. Great. Uh, to begin, I wanted to let you know that last month in February, we recorded Messiah, part the second and part the third. And I'm going to say those things several times. Uh, and just because it is Handel wrote part the second and part the third, not the second part, not the third part. Um, I guess it's just the way that uh, he wanted it to be. Um, so we recorded part the second and part the third with an octet of singers, soloists, uh, string quartet, trumpets, and harpsichord, all distance and massed. Uh, we did that last month. And we will release part the second on Palm Sunday and part the third on Easter Day. But as we get started, uh, just wanted to dispel a few myths and also give you some information on Handel that helps put Messiah into context. And then we're going to listen to some of our recording and talk about the libretto, especially, and uh, how that relates to the music. Of course, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end when we finish up. Uh, but myth number one is that it is not just a Christmas piece. I think that most everybody here knows that. But we all know that there are multiple performances of part the first around Christmas here. That's my impetus to record the other two parts this year. Because in my eight years now living in Buffalo, I've never heard of the other two parts being presented. In the orchestra world, Messiah is every bit an annual Christmas tradition as eggnog or overworked shopping mall Santas. And in the 2014-2015 season alone, 13 out of the 22 largest American orchestras performed the piece 38 times. So woe to the concert hall in the US or Britain that fails to schedule the piece when the holidays uh, arrive and as well when CD sales and web downloads of the oratorio soar each year. For many amateur choirs, the work is at the heart of their repertoire and often a high point of the year too. Librettist Charles Jennings, who was a close friend and collaborator with Handel, used the biblical stories of Jesus for Messiah's text. Jennings described his work as a meditation of our Lord as Messiah in Christian thought and belief. Other Handel oratorios had strong plots anchored by dramatic confrontations between leading characters. But Messiah offered the loosest of narratives. The first part prophesied the birth of Jesus with texts taken from the Old Testament prophecies of Messiah's birth. The second exalted his sacrifice for humankind with texts taken from the New Testament stories of the birth of Christ, his death and resurrection and part the third, the final section, proclaimed the resurrection, taken from verses relating ultimately to Judgment Day, with the final chorus text being drawn from the book of Revelation. The piece was originally conceived as a work for Easter, thus are releasing it on Palm Sunday and Easter. It went onto the stage of New Music Hall in Dublin on the 13th of April, 1742. The audience swelled to a record 700, <laughs> as he had heeded pleas by the management to wear dresses without hoops in order to make room for more company. Uh, if you all remember what it was like to be in a crowded room and hear great music. <laughs> uh, Handel's superstar status was not the only draw, however. Uh, many came to get a glimpse at the contralto, Susanna Sibber, who was then embroiled in a scandalous divorce. Soloists alternated with wave upon wave of chorus until near the midway point, Sibber sang, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. One of the arias in the piece and the reverend, reverend Patrick Delaney was so moved that he leapt to his feet and cried out, woman for this be all thy sins forgiven. 
Mm. There were several reasons for the choice of Dublin for Messiah's debut. Handel had been uh, sort of downtrodden by a dispirited reception that London audiences had given his works the previous season. He didn't want to risk another critical failure in England, especially with such an unorthodox piece for him. Dublin was one of the fastest growing, most prosperous cities in Europe with a wealthy, eager, wealthy elite eager to display its sophistication and the economic clout to stage such a major cultural event. It was a great advantage for Handel to make the voyage to Dublin to try out his new work and then bring it back to London. I think this is similar to a Broadway producer today who tries out a work in New Haven and then comes and stages it in New York City. Messiah's success in Dublin was quickly repeated in London. Should also know, Messiah was written in just days. He wrote the original version in just three to four weeks. Uh, it was intended for an Easter performance the following year. So he was so ahead of schedule, it premiered a year early. Most historic accounts estimate the composer spent only 24 days writing the oratorio. What makes this even more astounding is the sheer scale of the 259 page score. There's uncorrected errors or blotted out notes, but remarkably few mistakes given the speed of his writing. NPR music commentator Miles Hoffman as estimates that there are roughly a quarter of a million notes in Messiah. At a little more than three weeks at 10 hour days, Hoffman said that means Handel kept a continuous pace writing 15 notes a minute. Should also know that some people thought that it was blasphemous. Messiah was blasphemous. Given the oratorio's sacred subject matter and Handel's note on an original manuscript that read, to God alone be the glory, which those who know Bach, he wrote Soli Deo Gloria at the end of all his scores. It's hard to imagine that any audience would have interpreted this music as anything less than sacred. But opera and classical composers were often the subject of outrage in the 1700s. At a 1727 opera performance, Handel's leading sopranos, Francesca Cuzzoni and Faustina Bordini, obviously Italian, actually came to blows on stage with their partisans cheering them on. John Arbuthnot, the mathematician and satirist, wrote in a pamphlet describing the increasing hysterias of London's opera world and this incident that shame that two such well-bred ladies should call each other bitch and whore and should scold and fight. So it was, uh, it was a much different environment than we expect to go to a concert today and see everyone on their best behavior. Handel's opera Esther had also caused outrage from the Bishop of London when it was performed by the cathedral singers in 1732. When Handel moved from opera into oratorio with religious subject matter, many critics objected to the idea of mixing the sacred and the secular worlds where the same theater might host religious subject matter on one day and suggestive comedy the next. Handel hoped that advertising the piece as a sacred oratorio instead of Messiah would help diffuse any of the controversy and his decision to premiere the work in Dublin instead of London was in part to try to work away from the Anglican bishops in England who were on top of him about this. But even in Ireland, Jonathan Swift, yes, Jonathan Swift of Gulliver's Travels fames, uh, threatened to publicly forbid singers from St. Patrick's Cathedral from participating in the performance. And we know now that it was the combined choirs of St. Patrick's Church and Christ Church that sang the premiere. The next thing you should know, there is no definitive version. Bernstein once raised some eyebrows by reordering sections of Messiah for a Carnegie Hall performance. Not many conductors would have the confidence to tinker with the original intentions of a composer like Handel, but in reality, his intentions are probably hard to guess. Handel himself rewrote parts of the oratorio to better meet the abilities of soloist and the available instruments with each of the original 13 performances, which is why today we have version A, B, and C of a lot of the solos. In doing research for this recording that we made, I actually picked up a new score from Germany that even put some of these arias in the form of a recitative, uh, which shows some of the text is almost spoken. But historically, Messiah has changed with the ensembles that perform it. 
Mozart paid Handel the supreme compliment of reorchestrating Messiah in 1789 and gave it a more modern sound for the day by classical orchestra standards. Even Mozart confessed himself to be humble in the face of Handel's genius and that any alterations he made should not be seen as an effort at improvement. Quote, Handel knows better than any of us what will make an effect, Mozart said. When he chooses, he strikes like a thunderbolt. Handel's score calls for a typically Baroque orchestra of a few dozen players, mostly strings and woodwinds with only minimal brass and percussion, along with a small though skillful chorus. In most of Handel's oratorios, the soloists dominate and the choir only sings for a little bit. But in Messiah, the choir, the chorus, propel, propels the work forward with great emotional impact. It was not until after his death did immensely scaled performances become popular. As early as 1784, in a festival commemorating the composer's centenary, a year premature as it turns out, Westminster Abbey presented the oratorio with 60 sopranos, 48 countertenors, 83 tenors, 84 basses, which we would know is just to be a big messiah today, but six flutes, 26 oboe, 26 oboes, 26 bassoons, one contrabassoon, 12 horns, 12 trumpets, six trombones, 157 strings, assorted percussion and organ. And some 19th century performance brought thousands to the stage and it sounds like they were already approaching the thousands. Another myth I wanna dispel is that King George II did not stand during the Hallelujah Chorus. An often repeated legend about this tells us that King George II was so moved by the Hallelujah Chorus that during the London premiere of Messiah that he rose to his feet and then everyone in attendance followed suit as to not be sitting when the king stood. Thus, we believe the regularly debated tradition of standing during the chorus came to be, also giving birth to the countless passive aggressive battles of concert decorum between the sitters and the standers. However, according to various experts, there is no truth to this story. In fact, there is no evidence that King George II was even in attendance and it is unlikely that the newspaper reporters in attendance would have overlooked mentioning a royal presence. The first reference to this legend was a letter written 37 years after the fact. 2009 marked the 205th anniversary of Handel's death. And since there was a boon to the Baroque composer and his best known work. The commemoration centered in London, where Handel lived for 49 years until his death at the age of 74. The BBC broadcasted all of his operas, more than 40 in total, and every one of the composer's keyboard suites and cantatas was performed during the annual London Handel Festival, which included concerts at St. George's Hanover Square, where Handel worshipped, and at the Handel House Museum, longtime residence of the man that Beethoven himself, citing Messiah, said was the greatest composer that ever lived. He was born in Germany into a religious affluent household. His father, Georg Handel, a celebrated sur surgeon in Northern Germany, wanted his son to study the law. But an acquaintance, the Duke of Weissenfels, heard the prodigy then barely 11 playing the organ. The nobleman's recognition of the boy's genius likely influenced his doctor father's decision to allow his son to become a musician. By the age of 18, Handel had composed his first opera called Almira, initially performed in Hamburg in 1705. During the next five years, he was employed as a musician, composer, and conductor at courts and churches in Rome and Florence, Naples and Venice, as well as in Germany, where the Elector of Hanover, the future King George I of England, was briefly his patron. Handel's restless independence contrasted him with the other greatest composer of the age, Bach, whom he never met. Bach never moved out of the cocoon of court patronage or court employment. Handel, on the other hand, rarely attached himself to any benefactor for long, although he would compose court, compose court music when asked. He wrote the water music, one of the things that we know, in 1717, one of the few pieces that is other than Messiah that is recogniz recognizable to the average concert goer. He wrote that music for George I to be performed for the monarch as his majesty's barge navigated through a London canal on a summer evening. 
such free-spirited musical entrepreneurship was more than possible in London where Handel moved permanently in 1710. A commercial boom strengthened by overseas trade had created a thriving new merchant and professional class that broke the monopoly of cultural patronage by the nobility. Adding zest to the London musical scene were the rivalries that split the audience into two broad musical camps. On one side were the defenders of the more conventional Italian opera style. On the other were enthusiasts of Handel's new Italian operas. Increasingly elaborate opera productions led to rising costs due in part to hiring musicians and singers from Italy. It was generally agreed that Italian singers were better trained and more talented than local products. But beautiful voices were often accompanied by unpredictable temperaments. Remember the brawl with the two sopranos earlier? In the 1730s, the emotional and financial toll of producing operas, as well as changing audience tastes, contributed to Handel's growing interest in sacred oratorios, which required neither elaborate scenery nor foreign stars. With oratorios, Handel could really be his own master. But despite all this fame, Handel's inner life remains pretty mysterious. We know more about the environment in which he lived and the sort of people he knew than we know about his private life. This partially lies in the lack of personal letters. We rely on instead contradictory letters of Handel by admirers and detractors who, whose opinions were colored by the musical rival, rivalries in 1700s London. Although he never married, nor was known to have a long time, long lasting romantic relationship, Handel was pursued by various young women and leading uh, Italian soprano, Vittoria Tarquini, according to all accounts by his contemporaries. Intensely loyal to friends and colleagues, he was also capable of severe angry outbursts. Because of a dispute over seating in an orchestra pit, he fought a near fatal duel with a fellow composer and musician, Johann Matheson, whose sword thrust was blunted by a metal button on Handel's coat. Yet the two remained close friends for years afterwards. During rehearsals at a London opera house, with Francesca Cuzzoni, Handel grew so infuriated by her refusal to follow his every instruction that he grabbed her by the waist and threatened to hurl her out of an open window. I know well that you are a real she-devil, he said, but I, I will have you know that I am Beelzebub, he screamed at the terrified soprano. Handel also grew increasingly obese over the years and gained an intimidating physique. He paid more attention to food than is becoming to any man, wrote Handel's earliest bio sorry, lost that. Wrote Handel's earliest biographer, artist Joseph Guppy, who designed scenery for, Italian, for Handel's operas, complained that he was served a meager dinner at the composer's home in 1745. Only afterward did he discover his host in the next room secretly gorging on wine and French dishes. You'll see in the cartoon here that the irate artist produced a caricature of Handel at the organ keyboard, his face contorted into a pig snout, surrounded by fowl that would go into the pot, wine bottles and oysters strewn at his feet. All right, thank you, Matt. Although he may have been tight-fisted with food, he was not with money. Amassing a fortune through his music and shrewd investments in London's burgeoning stock market Handel donated generously to orphans, retired musicians, and the ill. He gave his portion of his Messiah debut proceeds to a debtor's prison and hospital in Dublin. A sense of humility permeates his music as well, a point often made by conductors who compare Handel with Bach. But where Bach's oratorios exalted God, Handel was more concerned about the feeling of mortals. Even when the subject of his work is religious, Handel is writing about the human response to the divine. Nowhere is this more apparent than Messiah. The feelings of joy you get from the Hallelujah Chorus are second to none. And who can resist the Amen Chorus at the end? There's little doubt about Handel's own fondness for the work. His annual benefit concerts for his favorite charity always included Messiah. And in 1759, when he was blind and in failing health, he insisted on attending a performance of Messiah in Covent Garden. Eight days later, Handel died at home. His total 
estate was assessed at 20,000 pounds, which made him a millionaire by modern standards. He left the bulk of his fortune to charities, much of the remainder to his friends, servants, and his family in Germany. But one posthumous present to himself were the funds, 600 pounds, for his own monument at Westminster Abbey, the final resting place for British monarchs and their most accomplished subjects. Three years after Handel's death, the monument was installed. At this point, I thought we could move to a little bit of listening. So the first chorus in part the second is, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. But we can, uh, if you will, just think back to some of the, uh, the parts um, in the, the first section, part the first, the alto aria. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. By keeping that imagery from the first part the first into part the second, can we really appreciate the way in which part the second begins? The introduction by the strings alerts us to a dramatic change in tone. And the words confirm our mounting fears, behold the Lamb of God intoned by the chorus. Though the text is from the New Testament, it uses the sacrificial language of the Old Testament and it leaves little room for optimism. The good shepherd has become the sacrificial lamb of God. The metaphor is not so much mixed as it is transformed in a terrifying yet miraculous direction. Matt, can we hear a little bit of that and watch? So from this first chapter of John, the phrase Lamb of God seems to recall the Passover story. Connection is given even further support by the fact that John alone, among the gospel writers, depicts Jesus's death on a cross in such a way to make it coincide with the slaying of the lamb for the Passover meal. John's special emphasis on this surprising dimension of Jesus's messiahship and his use of the title Lamb of God make the choice of this text for the opening of part the second especially effective. The next four pieces, he was despised, surely he had borne our griefs, and with his stripes and all we like sheep, comprise an extended musical soliloquy on Isaiah 53, the chapter which describes the suffering of one who was like a lamb led to slaughter. Now, can we hear about 30 seconds of each of these pieces?
Actually, we'll pause there for a second, Matt, and uh, we'll come to, uh, to the last one in just a second. Um, so in Isaiah 53, a new mold was cast, a mold that was there, ready and waiting, in Israel's faith when Jesus' followers struggled to make sense of his death. Some would even say that it's impossible to make sense of Gethsemane or Golgotha without Isaiah 53. The author of this chapter in Isaiah is also extremely realistic when it comes to human nature. Thus, the final chorus of the scene that we'll hear in just a second, all we like sheep. Uh, this analogy is far from flattering. Sheep have a reputation of following the first in line. As a result, the herd goes blissfully and often dangerously astray. Uh, so Matt, if you'll play a bit of this now and notice how even the vocal lines go astray. Great, thank you. Um, interestingly, also, that is one of the choruses that handle rework from a love song. And so uh, often the sopranos and tenors or the altos and basses have duets, and that would have originally been sort of the love duet, but each of the vocal lines sort of goes astray um, at the end. So as we're also coming into Palm Sunday and Holy Week, I think that we can move to the chorus, Lift Up Your Heads which is taken from Psalm 24. If you read the Psalm aloud, you will immediately be alerted that it is a question and answer. Imagine maybe how this Psalm might've been used in ancient Israel. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, lift up your heads and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. These verses are thought to have been an entrance liturgy, which was said or sung as the people of Israel processed toward Jerusalem and into the temple. As they neared the temple gates, there was, scholars think, some sort of antiphonal exchange. The people in the procession would have become, begun by addressing the gates directly. Be you lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Another voice from inside the temple then responds with a question. Who is this king of glory? The people outside clearly know and answer without hesitation. The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Perhaps this is akin to part of what we affirm in our antiphonal call to prayer, which is part of the Eucharist. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Handel, of course, sets this in a direct question and answer way. In placing the sections of this Psalm where they do, Handel and Jennings are making a 
bold theological statement. They have just finished their musical depiction of Jesus's crucifixion and death. In movement number 32, but thou didst not leave his soul in hell, hints of the possibility of resurrection. There is, this is a strategic point at which the verses from Psalm 24 are placed. And that context suggests an expanded answer to the question, who is this King of glory? In Messiah, it is not only the Lord of hosts who stands at the door and knocks, but the crucified and risen Christ. It proclaims that the Jesus of Nazareth is the King of glory, and he has come back from the dead to claim the throne. Matt, can we hear a little bit of lift up your heads? that you heard the dialogue the men would answer, ask a question the women would answer and then the women would ask a question and then the men would answer then they would all do it together so also as we're moving to easter i want to take a brief look at uh, something from part the third so the texts from seven out of the nine movements in part the third are from first corinthians chapter 15 which is paul's chapter on the resurrection that chapter is a good choice, considering what Handel and Jennings are trying to accomplish in this final section. To recap, part one was prophecy and advent of the Messiah. Part two was the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And part three, the goal will be to describe the redemption of the world through faith. I think part three, however, is the so what moment. You know, that annoying questions that everybody's kid asked, so what? moving past an explanation and into an application. But I think that Handel and Jennings tackled this head on. Frankly, they could have quit at the end of part two. They just finished telling about the suffering, death, and resurrection. It would have been a powerful finale with the hallelujah chorus, but they wouldn't have answered the so what question. What difference does it make for me, for you, for all of creation that Jesus rose from the dead? And wisely, their answer doesn't try to top the hallelujah chorus. Instead, part three opens with a single soprano voice. The melody and tempo are serene, confident, stately, and the text is intensely personal. I know, says that single voice, I know that my redeemer liveth. My redeemer, the same Jesus, the king of glory, the Lord of hosts is my redeemer. The cross and the empty tomb have implications for me. So what? That's what. That's what all of part third is about. For as much as those words belong with Paul's letter to the Corinthians, they are actually from the book of Job. We all remember Job. He was the one that sort of had a dark cloud over his head, falsely accused and could find no one to defend him. He loses his livestock, his servants, his children, and several simultaneous disasters. In Job 19, he suddenly says, I've run out of arguments. There's nothing I can say that will convince you that I'm innocent, but know this, that somewhere, someday, my redeemer will stand up and argue my cause before you and before God. And when he does, I will be exonerated. While this may not seem quite right to the understanding of redeemer when we think of Jesus Christ, it's not that far removed. Christ's role with regard to believing to believers is sometimes described in a way that is quite close to that Hebrew concept of Job. The soprano will later sing, it is Christ who appears at the right hand of God and makes intercessions for us. So this quote is not that far out of context as it first appears. Matt, can we hear some of, I know that my redeemer liveth?
that's my colleague uh, Claudia Brown, who's the uh, director of choirs at the University of Buffalo. So that wraps up a lot of my commentary tonight. Of course, I could go on and on about each movement and just the way I did these few. Um, I hope that you enjoyed a little glimpse into our Linton Messiah project. Um, the, story of, the story of Messiah is, after all, uh, told again and again in the passages that make up our lectionary. So these texts come up all the time and often I hear them in the back of my head when they're read, I hear them the way that Handel set them. And reacquainting myself with all this great music has uh, these texts become part of you and they sort of infiltrate everything that you, you end up doing day to day. And I'm just, I wanna convey to people that Messiah is more than the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, we do hope to record part the first in May so that we have a complete recording of Messiah available to our congregation and to the world on, on YouTube. So uh, I think that that will be a good pandemic project that we can, we have uh, hard evidence that, that we created during, uh, during this pandemic. Thank you so much, Garrett. That was so interesting from start to finish. And I loved getting a little sneak peek at what's coming soon. I'm so excited to hear the rest of it. So we have a couple more minutes. We try to normally end, you know, uh, by 820. Um, but I wanted to give anyone a chance to if anyone had any comments or um, questions for Garrett, or for anyone, uh, or wanted to talk about um, performing or anything that you guys wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm open to making this next couple of minutes yours. So do we have any burning questions or comments? There was a lot of stuff that he just presented. So um, is there any, any questions or comments? You need to unmute yourself as a reminder. Uh, before you ask, or we won't be able to hear you. <laughs> Has anyone oh, a burning ahead? comment? Garrett, that was just brilliant. I, I loved it from all of the, the research into um, Handel's own characteristics and and history through all of the way you related it, just passage by passage to biblical texts, none of which I had entirely connected in that way. And, and then the music, I wish you'd, I can't wait to hear all of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, I just loved it. So especially with all the Old Testament, uh, yes. there are, it's, it's interesting for us to look at it through our 20th, uh -huh. 21st century context of knowing the arc of the story it's hard to read those ancient texts in the Old Testament without thinking of it through our lenses. And that's, that's part of, you know, whether you think that the Bible is a collection of, of books that is a historical document, or whether you think that it was inspired by perhaps the Holy Spirit, uh, that arc is, is very clear in this, um, you know, relating those Old Testament stories of Isaiah or of Job. And I, I think that that's one of the brilliant things also of Genins, the, the librettus that these, something that you would not think of being as part the third that is about um, how does this apply to me going to Job. But I think that Job is the ultimate human experience. We've mm -hmm. all had that dark cloud over us, whether it's for a day or a week or some people years, but that even in that, uh, the narrator, the person that's singing at that point says that I still know that my Redeemer lives. And something that we would think, you know, I, if I heard that text, I'd say, of course, that's from a gospel or from one of Paul's letters. I wouldn't say that that's from Job. So I think that's one of the interesting things, too, is to really see what all the scripture references are for some of these things, even in part the second and part the third that are about Jesus's life, death, crucifixion, and into, um, into the resurrection and part the third that actually come from the Old Testament. Just the same way that, you know, in Advent and Lent, we often go to these, uh, these prophets in the Old Testament. What was especially nice was the way you organized that at the end with that coming back to, okay, so what is the so what? What is the application? What is our takeaway and that um, personal implication? I've never thought of the Messiah in that context and that's the way we've been doing this with our conversations in the Bible study with 
with Caitlin on on this pre-Easter. And, and so it was as though you just carried on for that. But that application and implication and the so what, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, because it, I mean, what a glorious ending too. I mean, he could have ended at the end of part the second and said, how will your chorus? Fine, we're done. Um, but then uh, thankfully the librettist and, and Handel bought into it that there, there was a whole other part that, that needed to happen. Yeah, I love that. Garrett, do you um, know any of the history of like why just the the Hallelujah Chorus has gotten so popular as to, and um, I know it's been like kind of cut and added onto the first part, just kind of completely cut out the entire Holy Week <laughs> basically and jumped to Hallelujah Chorus. And I understand that. But um, is there like a time period that that started becoming more popular or is it just kind of like it was a hit and that's why that's why we know it? I think it's probably, it could be both of those things. It, it was a hit and everybody liked it. It was something that, you know, has a hook uh, that we would say in listening to popular music today that people left humming. And I think that's part of it. Probably part of it too is advertising that has come to us in the last 50 or 60 years. And so we're sort of inundated with little clips of things. And that is one of the ultimate, uh, you know, hook clips that we can remember and so if you remember seeing a Pepsi can or something and the Howie, of course, is playing behind it because they released a new product or something, it makes you latch onto that product. So I think that advertising and our, our 20th century ways of, or 21st century ways of listening to things uh, probably plays in that context as well. Also, the lyrics were very easy to remember. That's true, yeah. It's mostly one word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Matt and I even talking about, uh, you know, how he's editing all this together. We, we talk about title cards for each of these movements. And I said, some of them don't really need a lot of title cards because, the, you know, the libretto has one line of text for music that could go on two or three minutes. So um, after you get it once, you kind of know what the rest of it's about, um, which I think also we think of... Uh, even the way churches were built and the way that there were stories in stained glass windows and there were stories in the architecture of the church. Perhaps that's one another reason why, I mean, of course, much Baroque music was said in this way where you would have one small bit of text and it would be repeated a lot. But perhaps that was a, a statement of faith that uh, Handel wanted these people to hear something and, and, and get it across in that way. So you, you heard it several times um, to, to make that statement. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to ask, you know, how was filming uh, and getting folks together? I know you've been doing some filming throughout the pandemic, but this is kind of the first, like, I feel like big thing that we've done, you know, since you've been filming, like I said, throughout, throughout the whole place. But um, what was the filming like? What was, what, um, how'd you do it? You know, how, how did that come together? It was just a lot of preparation, especially on Matt's part. And we, you know, had to figure out where cameras were going and where Solis would stand what, that way because we allowed the soloists to be unmasked um, so they were standing far enough away from everybody else the, the strings and myself and they were facing the other direction and then we had to figure out how where the trumpets could stand on the few movements that they play where they were playing away from everybody and uh, and then everybody was still distance it was just it was a lot of logistics and uh, that you know, I think a lot of what we do is already logistics, you know, week to week, uh, who's on first, who's on second, when we start processing, when, uh, you know, when to start the next piece. And so I think we're already sort of attuned to that, but also we've been out of the habit of that now for, as we said at the beginning of the year. So it was, it was a lot of just really thinking those things through and uh, creating very detailed plans. And of course, we're used to doing this with uh, when we hire in orchestra people anyway, is that we start with the most number of people needed and end with the least number of people. Um, so that also, I think, helped in pandemic times to really think about how many people were in the room at any time. And part of what we had to just resign ourselves to is that there are some things that happen that are unavoidable, that there's a recitative that happens and there's a soloist there and then the next, and there's no octet behind them. Then the next thing you see is an octet and there's no soloist. So it's just, it's the magic of television that 
these things happen. And, you know, as, as much as we tried to have, avoid that and think through how we could, uh, you know, make it look the most natural, there are some things that were just unavoidable. Well, yeah. And I think, you know, um, I know that a lot of people are used to this, but we're used to obviously performing it all as one with an audience, uh, with an audience or a congregation, obviously on a Sunday morning. Um, but without that there, um, was it different to do it in chunks and not necessarily kind of the arc of the, the piece, like where you normally get kind of the storyline? Um, yeah, actually when we see the next edit of this, um, because we're at that point, we've done two or three listings already, and we're now to the point of actually piecing it together, it is actually the first time that I will see this group do this entire thing in its exact order. So weird. Yeah, because, you know, even the soloists, we would have all the bass soloists together, and then all the tenor soloists, and so everything was was grouped in chunks, and then it was grouped in chunks for, uh, for the instrumentalist need, too, so um, it'll be great to actually hear it sort of and to see how it flows because when it is you know in the context of a concert or in the context of worship I have 100% control on how thing one thing goes into the next mm -hmm. sometimes you might wait an extra four seconds before you start the next piece because the room needs to clear and you need to let something settle but not having again not having people in the room does it matter I, I don't know these are things that will mm -hmm. be fascinating to see what happens when, when all this is put together. Yeah. All right, I wanna give everyone just one last chance. I've asked a couple of questions, but I just had some burning ones I needed to ask here. <laughs> now, seeing none, I'm gonna pray. Um, and this is going to be available on YouTube. Matt's gonna upload it. Um, so if you know any folks who would be interested in this, this is great stuff. So uh, feel free to send along. We'll make sure that the rest of the congregation gets it. There's folks who couldn't make it tonight um and so if you know anyone uh it should be up you know by the end of the week uh matt will send it to me and i can send it to everyone on here uh and we'll we'll send it along but uh thank you so much garrett for uh the gift of tonight and the gift of your research and uh we just can't wait to hear uh coming up so thanks uh let's pray Creator God, we thank you so much for the gift of music, uh, for we know that sometimes there's feelings and uh, the way that we feel and talk to you, uh, we just can't use the right words. And so we thank you, God, for the gift of music and the, the gift of musicians, especially in this time when we um, have been missing out or not been able to hear live music. We're grateful for the ways that we have, we're able to listen tonight and we're grateful for the work of the many hands that made this come together. We thank you for each person on this call tonight. Be with us, keep us safe, and give us rest. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, y'all, thank you so much, and we'll see you next month or throughout the week, whenever we see you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.